I know a lot of you guys feel spoiled. But I can tell you, I'm about to give you a warning that me spoiling y'all is going to come to an end probably tomorrow. Yeah, probably tomorrow. Or I would say technically Wednesday. Yeah, I'll probably do another video tomorrow. And I know I got a live stream, a Patreon exclusive live stream scheduled for Wednesday. But after that, you probably won't hear from me for approximately a week, at least a week. Because I'm, I'm flying to Los Angeles to work with some clients on Thursday morning. And most of you know that 90% of the time that I'm out of town, I don't, I don't upload any content. There's been a handful of exceptions. Like I remember when I was in Miami, I did some content last year. Uh, when I was on my cruise, I, I uploaded at least one video from when I was on my 10-day cruise to the Panama Canal. There might have been one or two other times I've taken trips where, uh, yeah, there was a couple, like one time I did a, I, I've done a couple live streams from Los Angeles. Because, you know, as you know, that's the number one city I have the most clients in. Well, at least I say the most one-on-one -on -one clients. Now, when it comes to like email consultations and Skype and telephone consultations, my clients are kind of all over the place. Not only just all over the United States, but all over the world. But when it comes specifically to one-on-one face-to-face -on -face coaching, I would say without question, yeah, I would say no less than 40 to 50% of all of my one-on-one face-to-face coaching session clients have been in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's that's where I, I've traveled to the most for one-on-one -on -one coaching. I think part of the reason is because I used to live there, and a lot of people know that. So they know I know the place in and out. And another place is Los Angeles, man. On the positive end, there's a lot of beautiful, sexy women in Los Angeles. But it's a very challenging place to hook up with women. I mean, I think there's a lot of large cities that are challenging. But Los Angeles in particular. Now, you would think I would have a lot of one-on-one -on -one face face coaching clients out of New York since it's real large. I think I've only worked with like two or three clients one-on-one -on -one in the New York area. Um, But by contrast, man, I've worked with, I can't even count how many clients I work with in Los Angeles for one-on-one -on -one face to face coaching. Um, Okay. <laughs> I got some beef with some of y'all. I got some beef with someone. Well, first, I'm going to start with some good news. As I already mentioned, I'm going to mention again, I'm very thankful for the growing popularity in my Patreon.com page, which is Patreon.com slash Mode One, M-O-D-E-O-N-E. I'm very thankful. As I mentioned in a previous video, in approximately the last six to seven weeks, approximately the last six to seven weeks, I say seven weeks, do you know about seven weeks ago, I only had somewhere between 170 and 175 Patreon supporters. I had between 170 and 175 Patreon supporters. Right now, as of this morning, I had 288. 288. So that's about, at minimum, that's about a 113 subscriber increase in the last seven weeks, and I would say actually more specifically, I would say a little over half of that number has come in just the last two weeks, just the last two weeks, since I switched to my new format, where I do a brief amount of content for the YouTube general public, and then the remaining content, you got to be a Patreon subscriber. Yeah, but yeah, I've gone from 170 to 175 to 288. That's my largest increase in Patreon subscribers in that shorter period of time. Because I, I I got I first got on Patreon in April, early April, no, mid-April of 2017 was when I first got on Patreon. Um, I didn't really bec start becoming active on Patreon until about mid to late June of 2017. I think my highest number last year was 215. Yeah, 215, which was in July. Yeah, that was my highest number last year. I had as many as 215 Patreon subscribers. But then I actually went down. <laughs> Sadly. Yeah, I went down. I reached my, my peak for 2018 was about mid to late July. I was up to about 215. 
Then I slowly but surely start going down. Yeah, I went down to as low after that, after July of last year, I went down to as low as about 160. I went down to as low as about 160. And then, like I said, just about, just under two months ago, I was only at about 170 to 175. Now I'm at 288. <coughs> so I'm happy about that. Now, speaking of my Patreon subscribers, I'm always looking for ways to better serve the needs of my Patreon subscribers because I love and appreciate them. I don't have no haters in that group. I don't have no harsh critics in that group. They give me nothing but love, respect, and support, and of course, financial support. So I got nothing but love for them. And if my Patreon subscribers want to offer me sub, sub, uh, suggestions for improvement or constructive criticism, I'm all ears. That's why I went to the Patreon, what's known as the Patreon Conference, last November. And I went to one in the Chicago area about a month and a half ago. Because I'm always interested in serve, better serving the needs of my Patreon subscribers. That's the good news. That's the good news. And here's where you're about to hear another infamous Alan Roger Curry admonishment. Hey, man. Don't come in my fucking comment section, offer me suggestions for improvements on my videos or what you think is constructive criticism. Number one, two things. If you're not a Patreon subscriber of mine, I'm not going to put much weight on your suggestions for improvement or your constructive criticism. If all you do is watch my videos for free on YouTube, yeah, I might, I might give you this much care this much about what you say. But for the most part, I don't give a fuck about your suggestions for improvement on constructive criticism. And even more harshly, if you don't own any of my books, if you don't own not one of my eBooks, not one of my paperbacks, not one of my audiobooks, <laughs> bruh, let me tell you, look, 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 I haven't said this in a while. This is one of my, I always keep talking about signature phrases. One of my signature phrases is look into my eyes. Look into my eyes. Man, I don't give a fuck about shit you say. Real talk. I don't give a fuck about shit you say. If you don't own any of my books, I don't give a fuck about anything you say in my comment section. And matter of fact, there's a greater than 50% chance I'm going to delete what anything you say in my comment section. And there's two things I hate is people either asking me a bunch of questions like dating advice questions, but yet they don't own any of my books or people offer me suggestions for improvement or and or constructive criticisms and they don't own any of my books. That's one of the first things I ask people when I do email consultation with people or Skype and telephone consultations. Well, one-on-one -on -one too. One of the first things I ask is, how many of my books do you own? You probably see me say that in the comment section. If somebody starts asking me a bunch of questions, one of the first questions I ask, I'll say, how many of my books do you own? If you tell me you don't own any of my books, Real talk. I only care about two people. And I said this when I first got on YouTube. I only really care about two groups of people. People who own one or more of my books, one or more of my ebooks, one or more of my paperbacks, one or more of my audiobooks. People who own one or more of my books. Or at minimum, people who are on the verge of purchasing one or more of my books. You don't own them yet, but at least you're on the verge of of purchasing one or more of my books. But if you don't own any of my books and you're not at least minimum on the verge, you have an above average degree of interest in purchasing one or more of my books, man, don't come in my comment section with critical comments. Like I had a couple guys um, come in my comments and say, see, this just shows that old adage, man, you can't please everybody. What was the criticism last year? What was the criticism last year? What was the criticism last year? Uh, people calling him. Um, a lot of my haters and critics were saying, Alan, your videos are too long. Alan, man, your videos would be a lot better if they were shorter. 
Alan, your videos will be a lot shorter. I think you would have more YouTube subscribers if your videos were shorter. I think you would have more Patreon subscribers if your videos were shorter. Well, that's actually turned out to be true. <laughs> I do have more Patreon subscribers. But um, now guess what the criticism is? Not by a lot of people. Not by a lot of people. Just by a handful of people. But now people, uh, I, I'm reading my comments. People saying, man, Alan, I don't like all these short videos, man. I don't like these short videos. Your videos are too short. Your videos are too short. <laughs> Can't please everybody. Can't please everybody. But yeah, man, on a real tip, though. Like, I hate to pick on this brother again. I'm not going to say his name, but he know who he is. And a lot of people in my comment section know what I'm talking about. The brother who I had to ask him to take down his video because he was copying off of my no free attention video. My no free attention video. We ended up, when I was talking to him through Facebook to ask him to take down the video, which he did, to his credit, he did, he took it down. But when I, I said, man, you don't know that's one of my signature phrases and signature philosophies from my book, The Possibility of Sex? And he was basically like, no, nah, I don't even know about your book, The Possibility of Sex. He basically went on to tell me he don't own any of my books. This dude was always in my comment section. Always, I would say for every five videos I did, he was in at least my conversation, at least three out of every five videos I did. But yet, he said he don't own none of my books. Why the fuck you listening to me if you don't own any of my books? I mean, real talk, other than to steal my shit. Jack my swagger, jack my shit. Why you in my comment section if you don't own any of my books? I mean, real talk, man. None of y'all should even be in my comment section on a regular basis if you don't own at least one of my ebooks, at least one of my paperbacks, or at least one of my audiobooks. If you don't own at least one or more of my books, or again, at minimum, you're not on the verge of buying one of my books, stay out of my damn comment section. Seriously, man, you asking to be blocked and or deleted. You asking to be blocked and or deleted. And in worst case scenario, I'm just disabled. You know, I did that for one video recently in the last two weeks. There was at least one video I did. I think it was my first copycat the, on this whole copycat issue. I actually disabled my comment section where people couldn't even post any comments. And that's that's the worst case scenario I'll do. I'll, I'll you know. Because actually, now that most of my most valuable content is on... um. Patreon, I really don't care about the comment section because people, Patreon subscribers, they can comment on my videos on my Patreon page. So I really don't care about the comment section. But on a real tip, man, but yeah, man, you, you know, you just can't please everybody. Now speaking, you know, I got to touch on it real quick because people have been doing videos saying, you know, I'm not a copycat of Alan Roger Curry. I was watching the game. I don't know how many of y'all NBA fans, but I was watching the NBA game between Toronto Raptors and who did they play? Oh, Philadelphia 76ers. And if you saw that game, Kawhi Leonard, who used to play for the San Antonio Spurs, he hit this incredible game-winning shot. He hit this incredible game-winning shot. But when they when you heard the NBA analysts talking about the game after the game was over, and you heard a lot of the NBA analysts talking about the game, who was the first person they compared him to? Who was the first person they compared him to? Not every, all the analysts, but at least half of them. Michael Jordan. They was like, man, wasn't that just like Michael Jordan? That was very Jordan-esque of Kawhi Leonard. Now, I'm sure that's probably a part of, well, I would say Kawhi Leonard, I don't want to speak for him because I don't know his thoughts, but I'm just going to say he probably has mixed feelings about that. Half of them is probably flattered by that because everybody recognizes that Michael Jordan's a great player, but I'm sure he wants to form his own identity. But when I did my video about creating and inventing something versus popularizing something or revolutionizing something, what did I say? I said that no one time people are going to always compare you to somebody else, compare you to somebody else, is when there's at least one other person who's, who, who's doing the same thing you're doing, but they've done it either better than you or more repeatedly than you. They've done it better than you, or they've done it more repeatedly than you. That's when you're going to always get comparisons. 
So if, if somebody's on YouTube saying, damn, well, why, why is anybody saying, Alan, you know, I'm being an Alan Roger Curry copycat? It wasn't my intention to be an Alan Roger Curry copycat. Well, obviously, there's two reasons. Number one, you must be talking about some of the same discussion topics and subject matter that I do. Something about your speaking style, the way you're verbally expressing yourself must be similar to how I express myself. But the, the biggest thing, going back to Michael Jordan and Kawhi Leonard, and this is going to be me being somewhat egotistical, but I don't give a fuck. I, when, if you remember, when I first came on YouTube, man, I said this. So I, I said, I don't, I'm not the biggest person on modesty. I, I'm, that ain't one of my strong points. I said that kind of half seriously, half light hardly. I said, modesty ain't one of my strong points. I know how to break shit down, man, when it comes to female sexual psychology. I know how to break it down. I know how to break it down so well that I was invited to teach a college class. I was a pro technically a pro college professor on this shit. I mentioned this a few videos ago. I was, one of the first, I was the first person in the Indiana University college system to ever be invited to teach a class about dating and relationships and human sexuality who was not in possession of either a PhD or a master's degree. That's how much, that's how thorough I am at breaking shit down. So if anybody's on YouTube trying to talk about the same thing as me, but they ain't breaking it down in the same, with the same intelligence that I do, the same articulation that I do, the same specific lengthy detail that I do, it's inevitable they're going to be compared to me. It's inevitable. Just like Kawhi, Kawhi, now Kawhi is a great player in his own right. He is a great player in his own right. But the reason why people were comparing him to Jordan is because Jordan was, was famous for hitting a, just a phenomenal number of game-winning shots. He was known for that. I mean, there's a lot of players in the NBA who have hit game-winning shots, but he was known for that. So whenever somebody hits a fantastic game-winning shot, there's a greater than 50% chance people are going to say, oh, he's just like Michael Jordan. When you talk about shit to do with a lot of shit I talk about, you're going to be in compared, whether it's your intention to be compared to me or not, people are going to compare you to me because I'm, I'm at a professor level. I'm at a professor level. But anyway, what I want to talk about in this video is some related to what Eddie Murphy said in an interview a long time ago. I never forget. And it relates to what I was just talking about at the beginning of this conversation about you can't please everybody. Eddie Murphy, which it amazes me, some young people don't even know who he is. I've had young people say, who's that? Who's Eddie Murphy? That's like 20 years from now, young people saying, Kevin Hart, who is that? I don't know who Kevin Hart is. Who is that? For you young people, let's just say, Eddie Murphy was the Kevin Hart of my generation, the Richard Pryor of my generation. Um, But he said in one interview one time, he said, he talked about the irony of wanting to be liked. The irony of wanting to be liked. 